Hello ladies, gents, and everyone. It is Monday, June 5th, and you know what that means? Yes, it is time to talk about the biggest space and astronomy news stories from last month, May 2023, and oh boy, we have a lot to talk about, so let's just go ahead and dive right in. First, a quick update from one of last month's news stories. So we know that ESA's JUICE mission launched successfully and is en route to Jupiter's icy moons, but one of its instruments, the RIM antenna, did not properly deploy. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that after three months of efforts, the ESA team was able to dislodge that stuck pin and that the RIM antenna fully deployed on May 12th. Spacecraft that can't use solar panels to meet their electrical needs instead use something called an RTG, which is a radioisotope thermonuclear generator. These aren't like nuclear reactors. Instead, they take advantage of naturally fissile material that decays very quickly and releases a lot of alpha particles, usually plutonium-238. And that may start to become a problem because plutonium-238 has to be produced and that doesn't really happen very quickly. NASA and the Department of Energy are currently producing it at a rate of a little over three quarters of a kilogram per year. And they hope to have that up to one and a half kilograms per year by 2026. That is enough to meet all of the currently planned mission needs for NASA, but that doesn't include any potential new missions. Notably, the top recommendation from the planetary science decadal, a Uranus probe and orbiter, would require a lot of plutonium. And a rep from NASA's radioisotope power systems said that they did not think that the current production plan would be enough to meet the decadal survey plan for that mission. And there may be other new missions coming up that would also need RTGs and plutonium-238. So I guess that's kind of a good problem to have because it means we have a lot of really cool missions to look forward to, but hopefully the budget and the technology to increase the current production rate will be enough to meet the demand for those missions. When stars run out of hydrogen to burn in their core, they enter a phase of a life where they are called red giants. Red giant stars cool down and expand, and the expanding layers of their atmosphere can consume planets that are in orbit around them. This is going to happen to the rocky planets of the solar system in a few billion more years. But while we've known about this concept of planetary engulfment for a long time, we've never actually seen it happening. Until now. Astronomers looking for signs of two stars merging back in 2020 found an unusual change of brightness in this star, and so they did some follow-up observations to try and figure out exactly what they were seeing. Between the new follow-up spectroscopic data and some archival infrared data, they were able to piece together what was happening. A companion to the star was starting to rub up against the outer layers of the star, producing a lot of heat in the process and beginning to slowly spiral inward, until finally it was consumed by the star, giving it this bright burst of energy. And that burned up companion was a thousand times less massive than the star, making it a planet roughly the size of Jupiter and making this the first ever observation of a red giant planetary engulfment. The young star Fomalhaut, with its bright, beautiful debris disk, has long been a target of interest for astronomers, so it was a logical choice to point the JWST at it for a closer look. And they found a beautiful level of detail in that disk. Previously, it was known that Fomalhaut had an outer belt of material similar to the Kuiper belt in the solar system and an inner belt of material similar to the asteroid belt. However, that inner asteroid belt had never actually been directly seen. Well, the JWST observations spotted that inner asteroid belt, at least the outer edge of it, and they found that it extended further out away from the star than they expected. They also spotted an unexpected intermediate belt in between the inner and outer belts, as well as a giant dust cloud in the outer belt that they think is from a collision of planetesimals. The new structure revealed in these observations shows signs that it might be from gravitational sculpting from as of yet unknown planets, perhaps as small as Neptune. Gravitational wave aficionados have been in the dark for the past three years as the LIGO and Virgo observatories went offline in 2020 to undergo some upgrades to increase their sensitivity. So when LIGO first came online back in 2002, its initial sensitivity was only 15 megaparsecs and actually didn't detect anything during that run. After this latest round of upgrades, its fourth run is expected to have a sensitivity out to 190 megaparsecs. So LIGO's test run early in May was successful and on May 24th, they kicked off a 20 month observation run. Unfortunately, the Virgo instrument in Italy, which works in concert with the two LIGO observatories is still offline. Damage in some of the older parts of the Virgo instrument is creating a lot of extra noise that would overwhelm some of these sensitive signals that they're hoping to be able to detect. So additional work is needed before the instrument can come back online. Over the next couple months, the Virgo team is actually going to be going inside the vacuum chamber to do some repairs, which is a somewhat risky maneuver, but they're hoping to have that done by July so that they then can do test runs and get everything working and up and running to be able to join LIGO in doing observations by this fall. While the LIGO observatories can do really cool science and observations on their own, Without Virgo, the location of these gravitational wave sources on the sky just really cannot be localized very well. So hopefully everything will be up and running as soon as possible. 
Back in April 2021, NASA awarded a contract to SpaceX for a lunar lander that would carry astronauts between a future lunar gateway station and the moon's surface. NASA had hoped to make two awards on that contract for the sake of competition and redundancy, but they said at the time that they unfortunately just did not have the funding to realistically do that. Now, the losing bidders on that contract, Blue Origin and Dynetics, both protested the award to SpaceX, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. However, Congress raised some concerns about this dependency on a single party. And back in March of last year, NASA announced that they would be soliciting bids for a second lunar lander. As expected, both Blue Origin and Dynetics submitted bids for this new contract, and on May 19th, NASA announced that they were awarding the 3.4 billion contract to Blue Origin. Under this contract, Blue Origin will be providing the landing services for the Artemis 5 mission, which is scheduled for no earlier than 2029. And they will have to demonstrate their capability to do so at least a year in advance. Under its contract, SpaceX will be providing landing services for Artemis missions 3 and 4. And then after Artemis 5, the two companies will compete for future missions. This is the same idea that NASA uses for crew missions to the ISS, which have been awarded under two contracts to SpaceX and to Boeing. However, we've seen that that does not always work out. Boeing has yet to make a crewed launch of its Starliner spacecraft. And at a press conference last week, NASA and Boeing just announced they are not attempting the July crew flight test, and there is not a new date set yet for that to happen. Last week marked an exciting new space flight record, and that was the most number of people in orbit around the Earth at one time. There were 17 people spread across four crews as of late on Monday, May 29th. The Chinese Tiangong space station had six people, three Taikonauts from the Shanzhou 15 mission, and three newly arrived Taikonauts from the Shanzhou 16 mission, which had just launched on Monday. The ISS had 11 people, including the seven members of Expedition 69, which is three Russian cosmonauts, three NASA astronauts, and one UAE astronaut, as well as the private mission Axiom 2, which had two Americans and two Saudis on board. Both Shenzhou 15 and Axiom 2 have since returned to Earth, so now there's only 10 people overhead. Axiom 2 also marked the 600th person to ever enter Earth's orbit with Ryana Barnawi, who is also the first Saudi woman in space. And Axiom 2 was commanded by former NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson, who extended her record as the American with the most cumulative time in space, now at over 675 days across three NASA missions and the Axiom mission. Just before the Shenzhou 16 launch last week, the China Man Space Agency held a press conference and they revealed some new details about some of the lofty goals for their space program. After successful lunar rovers and lunar sample return, their moon program is now looking forward to its crewed exploration phase. And the goal is to land Taikonauts on the moon by 2030. Supporting this goal will require the development of a new generation of launch vehicle and crew spacecraft, as well as lunar lander, moon suit, and launch site. This supports their stated longer-term goal of establishing a permanent lunar base in the 2030s called the International Lunar Research Station. The plan is for this station to be coordinated by a group of nations under the International Lunar Research Cooperation Organization, which is somewhat similar to the US-led Artemis Accords, onto which just last week Spain became the 25th signatory. Nations might be signing on to the ILRSCO as early as this month. Now, don't expect the US and China to be coordinating on these projects anytime soon. Ever since 2011, Congress has actually specifically prohibited NASA from any sort of bilateral agreement or cooperation with China. The closest supernova to us in the last five years just exploded on May 19th, and it was first spotted by the amateur astronomer Koichi Itagaki in Japan. Itagaki has been searching for supernovae as an amateur for over 20 years, and he's pretty good at it with 172 discoveries to his name. The supernova SN2023 IXF was located in M101, aka the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is only 21 million light years away. The supernova is bright enough to be easily detectable even in a small telescope and will be for the rest of the summer. So M101 is located in the constellation Ursa Major if you're interested in checking it out for yourself. After Itagaki's discovery, scientists were able to search archival data and find evidence of the supernova starting two days earlier from these wiki transient facility. Follow-up observations have shown it to be a type 2 supernova, the brilliant death explosion of a massive star. We know JWST can probe the distant reaches of the universe, but it can also spot some things a lot closer to home. In this case, an epic water vapor plume from Saturn's icy moon Enceladus. We've seen these plumes before thanks to the Cassini mission, which was in orbit around Saturn. Cassini actually flew directly through the plumes to sample them. 
but this plume was a monster, spanning over 6,000 miles and spotted by JWST from hundreds of millions of miles away. Enceladus itself is only just over 300 miles wide. <laughs> And this plume was pouring water vapor into space at a rate of 79 gallons per second. From this JWST observation, scientists were actually able to see how the water from this plume spreads into the water torus in Saturn's E-ring. They found that about 30% of the water goes into the torus, while the other 70% escapes into the rest of the Saturnian system. Well, those were the stories that caught my eye from the month of May. Thank you so much for joining me, and we will definitely do this again next month. In the meantime, come back next Monday for another science video. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you have a good one. See you again soon. Bye!